I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and we got another unplanned, unoutlined, and totally insane episode of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. This would be episode number 67. Show notes, if there are any, will be available at gunrightsintexas.com slash 067. We don't have a gun of the show or a carry tip again this week, simply because, well, I've been on vacation. I took vacation time from work, got a bunch of stuff out of the way. I was hoping to see my nephews when they came through, but they didn't come close enough that I could run to them and see them for any reasonable amount of time or see them at all without upsetting their parents' moving schedule. So seeing my nephews will have to wait till another day. However, I have learned something very important from all this. I hate vacations. I hate real estate. And I'll get into that in a moment. In this episode, we're going to talk a lot about being prepared. Being prepared for various situations. Being prepared for what you know you're going to go into and what you think you may go into. However, before I do that, let me hit the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And when that gets through playing, I will come back and we'll talk a little bit. And I'll run the audio clip that tells you how to follow the show on social media. And then we'll talk a little more and I'll run the audio clip that tells you how to contact me. And then I'll talk a little bit more and sign the show off. Or at least that's the plan. Some of that may not happen. Some of it may happen more than I plan. Who knows? However, here's how you get the show. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. As I said, this was, uh, I took vacation this week. And my problem is when I have time off from work, I tend to, how do you put, how's the best way to put this? When I have time off from work, I tend to do a lot of things that eat up a lot more time. I tend to work harder. And, well, taking vacation time seems to have magnified that. I didn't take a full week off of work. I took basically two extra days. And that is nothing special in and of itself, except those two extra days made me more exhausted than I think I have been in years. I said I hate real estate. Well, I own some land inside city limits of a small town here in West Texas. And, well, I had somebody approach me about buying the land. We reached a price that was agreeable to us both. And we began the process of selling them the land. Well, the way it works. In Texas, there's a number of ways you can transfer ownership of land. There's something called a quick claim or a quick claim, as some people may pronounce it. But basically, you give up your claim on the land. When you do that, the people that would inherit it from you or that you have established would take possession of it in the event that you no longer own it, they immediately assume ownership. And that's one way to transfer land. Or at least in Texas. Well, that really wasn't applicable in our case. Then you have what's called a special warranty deed. A special warranty deed is a weird little document. It says, okay, I am responsible for anything I may have occurred as far as defects on the land. Defects meaning liens or um, expenses that could cause somebody to lose the land. I'm responsible for the ones that I have brought in, but I'm not responsible for any that preceded me or anybody else had.
Well, those are kind of frowned upon when you're selling land from yourself to somebody else. And the most common way of selling land in Texas is with a warranty deed. Now, a warranty deed says, this is the land, these are the defects I know about, and since I'm making them clear to you, you are assuming these defects for yourself. Now, there may be no defects. There may be a few defects. But if there's defects that turn up that are not listed, the person that is signing off on the warranty deed has to take care of them. So let's say I'm selling land for myself to John Doe. And I fill out a warranty deed. And the funny thing is, I can, I can uh, put my name on it. I can fill it out. Get it notarized. And when I notarize it, I got to sign it in front of the notary. And when I sign in front of the notary, the notary signs it, stamps it, records it in their logbook, and then we complete the deal with the person that's buying the land. Well, the funny thing is, you don't really have to, you don't have to actually let the other person know that they're going to be the new owner of the land. You can take and issue a warranty deed and file it yourself at the county clerk's office which is where you record a warranty deed. You file this warranty deed at the county clerk's office. The county clerk takes it. Hey, okay. All the records in the county clerk's office are updated. It gets published in the newspaper and the public notices, or not public notices, but, uh, and there's a section of the paper where you see these things published. I forget what it's called. Usually over there by the police blotter. And then the tax office updates their records based on the county clerk's records. The funny thing is, the person that's receiving the land doesn't have to sign it. They don't even have to file it. The person or the person buying the land, the person selling it can fill it out, sign, sign it in front of the notary, get the notary to notarize it, go to the courthouse, file it with the county clerk, and the person buying it will never, or the person that's receiving it never knows they actually own the land now until the quick, until the warranty deed shows up in their mailbox. Because my understanding is after you pay the fee to file it, they process it, scan it into their computer, copy it and add it to their bound book, whatever they do. And then... They mail the original to the person that now owns the land. Okay. So I go through the process. We negotiate a price. And I should have gone to the county clerk's office and made sure that there there was nothing against the land. It would only make sense. So I go to the county clerk's office. Or... I get the warranty deed filled out, and these folks, they're from another state where everything's complicated by regulation, and it kind of scares them that there's only one very simple, very crude-looking paper involved. Well, they want to do more research. It's a lot of money, and I'm all for making everybody feel comfortable. Well, in the course of more research, it turns out that somebody had placed a lien against the land. I didn't know about this lien. I had never received notification of it. The lien was actually against somebody else. And it got attached to my property. Well, I had to deal with this because this was a defect against my claim of the land. I get it cleared up. I have all the documentation showing it's cleared up, and now the people that are wanting to buy it, they're like, okay, 
but we want to go through an attorney now because it can't be this easy. Fine. You know, bring an attorney in, you pay the attorney's fees, and we'll look over the deed. In the meantime, I have gone to the county clerk's office, and I've checked. There's no other defects against the property in the county clerk's office, so everything's cool there. But this is the kind of thing that if you don't do it regularly and you don't really, and you're not really 100% considered an expert on the field, you really do need to talk to somebody and get some advice on how to do it. Since I've gone through this, and this decision was made somewhere between them getting scared of a single sheet of paper transferring the ownership of the land to them and the uh, next two days when they discovered there was this lien against the land that I had nothing to do with. I, in that time, I had decided, well, I'm going to talk to somebody and make sure I'm 100% right because the person I had spoke to was from the county clerk's office. I asked somebody from the county clerk's office because I remember I had to file it when I got the land. So I knew that they would know the process themselves that I would have to go through. So I had spoke to them and they explained it to me, but I got to thinking, I think it'd be better if I talked to somebody that was an expert in the field like a realtor. And the realtor that I spoke to was nice enough. They explained to me, well, a lot of people that come from out of state are used to having to file several different pieces of paper. They're used to having to pay a sales tax on the land as well as a recurring property tax. I'm thinking, my God, how, how many ways can you tax property in these other states? Well, after talking to them, I kind of understand that, understand these folks desire to want to go through an attorney on it. In fact, I don't blame them. If I was coming from a state like Massachusetts, or sorry about mispronouncing it, or New York, or California, or any state where Everything has to be overly complicated because of government interference. I, too, would be nervous about something as simple as the way it's done in Texas. You may be thinking, why are we talking about real estate when this is a gun podcast? That's because it applies to guns. We have people from out of state. They come in. Well. This can't be the case because this is how it is where I'm from. And we, we ridicule them. We dismiss them. And the funny thing is, these people don't really understand any other way because they have never seen any other way. But hang on to that thought because here's how to, get, how, here's how to follow the show on social media. And when I come back from that, I'll continue that thought. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. So how does the complexity or the lack thereof of land or property sale in Texas transfer to firearms ownership? Well, the simple truth of it is just about everybody that has sold a gun in a private transaction in Texas 
to somebody that's new to gun ownership or new to the state has under has undergone something similar. You meet them, they look the gun over, they give you your money, you give them their gun, you part your ways. Because one, you've already checked to make sure that you've done your due diligence to make sure they're not a criminal and that they're a Texas resident. You have made sure their money is real. They've made sure the gun is a real item that they're wanting. Everybody's happy. And everybody goes about their own business. Well, when you're dealing with somebody that's new to the state or new to firearms ownership, the first thing they ask you before you complete the transaction, how do I register it? How do I transfer it to my name? How do I put it in my name? Is this legal? Questions along that line. Why? Why do they ask this? Because where they're from, this is the way it is, or this is how they understand it because that's all they've ever seen on TV. You have this crime drama where first thing they do is when they pull a bullet out of somebody, they put it under a microscope, take pictures, Feed the pictures into a computer. The computer then compares the ballistics data from the rifling. And within seconds, comes back with a picture of the owner, an address, a picture of their car, how much they made, where they work, their phone number, all their criminal convictions. Wait a minute. And the, this is all done in states like Florida and Nevada where they really don't have these databases. And even if they did, it wouldn't work anything like that. Number one, there's no ballistics database on new firearms. To my knowledge, there's no state that requires a database that shows the rifling of a bullet fired from a single gun. It would be pointless. You fire 100 bullets to a modern firearm and the the that first bullet and that last bullet will have different markings on them because the rifling has worn during that hundred rounds the tighter of the bore the tighter the bore is the more variation there will be But people see this and they think that's the way it is because they have no point of reference that it's not right. As gun owners that have actually taken time and studied their firearms, studied the way things work, made sure they understand this is how it works, this is how it's supposed to work. We know how it is. We know how it's supposed to do it. We know how it's supposed to be done, and we know what is and is not legal. But somebody that's new to firearms ownership or somebody that's not really, they're not really experienced with it, they don't know this. They don't understand this. And that's sad. That's really sad. And then this applies to this applies to carrying a gun. You see a lot of people going out, they're getting ready. January first, we'll have open carry. And everybody's excited. I'm excited. I'm not going to do it very often. In fact, I've got plans to open carry precisely one time. Right after midnight, January 1st, I plan to go get gas and open carry the Kimber Custom TLE2 that's sitting on the 
reloading bench in front of me. I plan to carry that openly to get gas in my Jeep on January 1st, shortly after midnight when it's officially legal. I will do it one time. And that is it. That's all I plan to do it. I don't intend to do it every day. I don't intend to walk around and throw my hip out trying to get people to look at my gun. Kind of like the guy in the skirt at, with the blue gun in a holster at the Capitol did. I know, I know, it's a kilt. But without the sporn and the correct... Okay. A lot of people are going to say it's plaid. But it's called tartan. Without the correct tartan, or, and I know I'm mispronouncing it. I'm exhausted. It's after one o'clock when I'm recording this. But without the correct tartan and the sporin, it's not a kilt. It's a skirt. But the thing is, people that are not familiar with open carry, which will be the vast majority of the public, they're not going to know how to react. They're not going to know this is legal. They're not going to know this is perfectly fine. And a lot of people are going to be going out there. They're going to open carry just to celebrate that they can, kind of like I will be. But they're going to go into businesses. They're going to go everywhere they can. And a lot of people are going to be trying to draw attention to their gun so that they can have a man with a gun call, get the police to respond so they can bait them into one of these, I don't have to show you ID, am I being detained, am I free to go, yada, yada. Well, when that happens, it's going to cause a lot of friction. Stores are going to throw up 30-06 signs. They may even go so far as to throw up both 30-07 and 30-06 signs. But our goal will be to minimize that. We have to minimize it. Because if we don't minimize it, things will get more complicated. They will become more difficult to deal with the public. And we have to find a way to be prepared to deal with it. Which brings us to our next thought, which is being prepared. And I want to touch on that immediately after you listen to how to contact me. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. And we are back. For all that it's worth. Being prepared. You got to be prepared for the inevitable man with a gun call when you're open carry in a state that hasn't had open carry in over a century. How do you get prepared for that? Well, first off, you make sure that your gun is on one side, your strong side, and you make sure you have your ID and concealed handgun license, which at that time will be licensed to carry on the other side. This is a good practice anyway. It could be a carry tip, and it probably will be in the future. But anything that you're going to normally reach for that you carry with you, carry it on your weak side. One, this will help build up strength and control in your weak hand. And two, if you're reaching for that and something happens, your strong hand is still free to draw your weapon. You don't know how 
it relieves a police officer when they stop you and you explain to them before I reach for my weapon, uh, before I reach for my license, let me tell you, I have a Texas concealed handgun license. The weapon's on my right side. My ID's in my wallet on my left side. It relieves them because now they know where the weapon is and they know you're not going to be reaching past it to get your ID. It, will, it lowers their stress level. I have never been disarmed by a police officer. I've had them tell me, well, keep your hands away from your guns. I've had them tell me, don't show me yours. I won't show you mine. I've had them uh, ask me what I carry, which I've got a very funny story about that one. And I've had them... I've had them ask me if I would mind stepping out of the vehicle where they could watch me while they run my information. I have been pulled over twice while carrying a concealed handgun. I have had a lot of encounters with police officers relating to work or property I'm dealing with and things like that. But I've only been pulled over twice while carrying. One time was because I was low on gas and, well, if you drive a Jeep, the whole, uh, the whole idea of a speed limit is kind of a joke. Not because you're going to have a hard time, uh, hard time staying below the speed limit. It's because you're going to have a hard time reaching the speed limit. Especially if you drive something like I do, which is an LJ Rubicon with a straight six and 411 gears. I have plenty of torque. I can go anywhere that I want to. I just can't do it fast. I can run 75 miles an hour, but I get my best gas mileage in the 60 to 70 range. In fact, 65 is usually where I get my best gas mileage on the highway. The engine's turning low enough on RPMs that I can get good gas mileage and I don't have to worry about being too late. But I've been pulled over twice, once because I was driving slow because I was almost out of gas. I didn't realize it, but somebody had siphoned, siphoned fuel out of my tank. So I was going slow to make it the other 10 miles into town. I made it into town on vapors. It was actually starting to... The engine was actually starting to miss when I pulled up and made it to the pump. That's how close it was when I got there. And I, I actually asked the uh, police office or the state, the sheriff's deputy in this case that pulled me over, asked him to follow me to make sure I didn't run out of gas and have to call him back. He thought that was amusing. And we got there. I bought him a soft drink as a thank you because they, the convenience store that I stopped to get gas at gives the officers coffee for stopping there. So anyways, the other time I've been pulled over, I was dealing with, uh, I'm cruising along and the state trooper crosses the median, gets behind me, lights me up. I pull over. And this is, this is when I was driving the vehicle I had before the Jeep. He pulls me over. And I can see he's got a, he's got a new officer he's training. And he comes up, he says, you realize you're, uh, you were speeding. Which I thought was odd. 
because my speedometer didn't say I was speeding. I told him I didn't realize that. Uh, my speedometer said I was doing 74. He said, well, I clocked you at 85. Hmm. Something wasn't right there. Well, it turns out. He goes back. He looks on the radar gun. Oh, yeah. I was doing 75, not 74. And he misread the machine. It shows that officers are human. He comes back to the vehicle. Gives me my ID and all back. And he apologizes, tells me, hey, I'm sorry, I misread it. I was talking to him, explaining to him the, explaining to him different things. And the number 85 had been tossed about. I guess I thought I read it. I mean, he was very profound and his and profusely apologized. And I understood, you know, they're human just like me and everybody else. Well, maybe not me. That's a joke. But anyways, when, when I had told them where the weapon was, what side of the body it was on, and what side my ID was on, both times the officers were relieved that I wouldn't be reaching past that weapon. In fact, the, the sheriff's deputy that pulled me over in the Jeep, he kind of asked me, you get pulled over a lot? I told him, no. Well, why do you have it in your left pocket? Or your left hip pocket then? I told him, I said, well, basically, it's one of those deals where I don't want to I don't want to be explaining to somebody that how's the best way to put it? Because I don't remember exactly what I told him. I told him something to the effect of I don't want to reach past the weapon every time I reach for my wallet. If something happens and I'm pulling my wallet out I want to have my strong hand free to grab my weapon. And he understood that. And to him, that was the first time he heard somebody that didn't carry a gun as part of their livelihood. Let's put it that way. That was the first time he had heard anybody who didn't carry a gun as part of their livelihood mention keeping their strong hand free to go for their weapon. And that's part of being prepared. This week, I was mowing that the property I own. I was mowing that. And I thought I was prepared. I had a lot of very cold power aid. I had a lot of very cold water. I had a lot of sunblock. I had a baseball cap. I had some clip-on sunglasses for my eyeglasses. And I still got sunburned. I still got too hot out there. Why? Why? Because I thought I was prepared when I wasn't. But I was well enough prepared that it could have been a lot worse. I'm now three colors. I am now dark tan, red, and pasty white. Where before I was mostly pasty white with a light tan. And that's because I wasn't prepared. I should have thought about it. The humidity we've got right now, the amount I was sweating, how much I was rehydrating. I should have realized I would need more sunblock applications than what I had done. But I wasn't prepared mentally. 
I had everything I needed, but I wasn't prepared for it mentally. And when we go out there and we're dealing with law enforcement, those first few days, those first few weeks, those first few months that open carry is legal here in Texas, we have to approach it with, we got to be prepared physically, we got to be prepared emotionally, and we got to be prepared mentally. And physically, we got to make sure that one, that we're wearing our weapon in a way that's perfectly legal. We can not, we cannot wear our weapon in a thigh holster that's not connected to the belt. We cannot wear our weapon that's going to be openly carried in a calf holster or in an ankle holster. It has to be attached to the belt or in a shoulder holster. And that's how you're physically prepared. You make sure that your gear meets the requirements of the law. And I recommend a good gun belt, a good quality holster, not n none of this nylon junk or this uh, brittle hard plastic that likes to snap if you put just a little bit of pressure on it. And physically also includes don't touch it. That's right, don't touch it. Once you got that gun on, leave it alone. Did you know every case of negligent discharge with a modern firearm has been because somebody was handling it? If you don't touch it, you're not handling it. If you're not handling it, you don't have a negligent discharge. Just a thought. But here's the deal. You're physically prepared. You got a good holster. You got a good belt. You're not touching the weapon. And somebody confronts you. Maybe they're a peace officer. Maybe they're not. This is where you got to be emotionally prepared. Be the better person. Stay calm. Do not get confrontational. If, if you have a police officer pointing a gun at you, think Speak, don't move unless you're following the directions that are being given to you by all the officers. If you're getting conflicting directions from, from officers, just don't move. You don't do anything, they're not going to do anything. And be sure to speak. I cannot fall to the ground and stay and not move. Do I do I not move or do I fall to the ground? This is how, that's how you address conflicting instructions. You got to be prepared mentally. You have to know what you're going to do. You're approached by a law enforcement officer. They want to see your ID. Well, rather than getting into a contest with them over who's going to get the most YouTube views, just give them the ID. Document it. Record audio, record video, document the encounter, but don't argue with them on the side of the street or in the parking lot or on the floor of the business. You have a problem. You don't argue with them there. You move, you move on. And then you go to their department. You speak to their supervisor, not on the scene. Unless things are getting out of control there, then you ask for their supervisor. Instead, you go to their, you go to their office and you have a sit down with them. This shows that one, you are prepared to deal with this. Two, you complied. You made sure that everything was de-escalated. And three, it shows that you really do want to resolve this 
in the best possible manner. Well, you go through all these steps. And now, instead of having a 20-minute video where you and the officer are having a screaming match at each other, and where the officer's saying, it's my authority, and you're saying, cold dead hands, guess what? You both move on. Nobody's got raised blood pressure. And your next stop is the police station where you file a complaint. Or you just simply talk to the supervisor. Okay, look, this is what happened. This is why it's got to be dealt with. And this is why it's not right. Guess what? You have just affected their training. You have caused them to stop and think about it. Now, if you puff up on the street or in the parking lot or inside the business, you puff up with them there, you're just making them dig in and uh, take up root. They're not going to change their position then. But if you turn around, you go to their supervisor in his office, whether it's uh, their lieutenant or their chief, or maybe you're going to talk to the city manager because it was a city police officer that did it. Why would you want to talk to the city manager? Because the city manager is the one that's going to have a performance review by the city council and the mayor and any lawsuits that are filed that he's been given warning about. He tends to make sure changes happen so he doesn't get sued. Well, there you are. You have the emotional preparation for dealing with the police. But what if you're confronted with a mad mom? You know what you do? Excuse me, and you walk around them, or you walk the other direction. Or, I'm sorry, but you're blocking my path. Can you please move? If they don't, you go another route. If they continue to yell or scream or they follow you, call the police. But you have to be the one being the bigger, you have to be the one being the bigger person. You have to be the one controlling the situation. If the officer shows up, you got to give him enough control that he thinks that he is in complete control of the situation. But you control the direction it goes. You do that by letting him, you give him what he wants, and you de-escalate the situation there because you don't want that confrontation in public. You want to take that confrontation to the office. You want to make sure there's an official record with an official complaint. And if the mad mommy comes up and makes a scene, you want her to look like the irrational one. And that's why we're going to win. So on this episode, we discovered that I hate vacations. I hate real estate. We've talked about uh, being prepared. And in all honesty, I don't even remember if I hit the contact info. Just in case I didn't, here it is. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well... That wraps up this episode pretty much. I don't know if I've done the contact information once or twice. If I did it twice, oh well, who cares? 
you, have, you now have had two chances to hear it. And if you need more, you can always rewind because it's a podcast. But hey, when January 1st comes around, remember, we got to be the bigger party here. We have to be the ones that show up. We have to be the ones that impress upon the public that we are the good guys. We are the responsible people. And when we do that, we win. With that said, stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Now, some of the listener feedbacks that I got from the last episode surprised me. You see, I had listeners that they liked the unplanned episode. I don't really understand that because that one, to me, that was probably the, the worst episode I have ever done, the roughest, the most uncomfortable episode I have ever done. This one here I don't think is too much better, but of course, when you have an episode that bad, this one cannot be any worse. And just a little bit better feels a lot better. But hey, one thing I have done this week, I have been doing a lot of work with someone else. We're talking about launching another podcast about automobiles. And this isn't going to be a typical podcast because you see, you have podcasts about hot rods or about this show, or maybe they're building this car, they're modifying that car, or maybe they're off-roading. The podcast that I'm working with somebody on, if this actually comes to fruition, it's going to be a kind of, kind of a variety podcast where we talk about off-roading. We talk about fabrication, we talk about this, and we talk about that. We may even talk about uh, this show or that show on TV. But let's face it, car guys tend to be gun guys. Car girls tend to be gun girls. And it works both ways. And I have a theory about that. Guns represent freedom. Cars represent freedom. I don't think that's a coincidence that people that have an interest in one have an interest in the other. But hey, I'd like to say thank you to everybody that emailed me about that last episode. Both the people that hated it and the people that loved it. I do want to get back to having everything planned out. I know, uh, Myra, you really like the unplanned episodes, but really, we got to have some show notes. And if I don't plan it out, there's not going to be any show notes. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. <laughs>